Uh, you can also use estradiol, and this was also discussed earlier in one of the presentations in the luteal phase. And uh, this uh, French group used four milligrams of estradiol uh, starting seven days before the presumed menses uh, uh, pretreatment. Uh, they, similarly to the contraceptive pill findings, they had longer stimulation, there was need for more gonadotropins, but there was no difference in the uh, live birth rates. So in summary, uh, the contraceptive pill pretreatment necessitates longer stimulation with more gonadotropins. Uh, it doesn't seem to have an impact on stimulation parameters, but there appears to be a reduction uh, in the uh, pregnancy rate. No such reduction in the pregnancy rate was seen, however, with the uh, estradiol pretreatment. So the other question is, if we achieve a sudden um, uh, suppression of the LH level, do we have to compensate somehow for this? Do we need to increase the dose of the gonadotropins uh, as we start the antagonist? And again, many groups uh, looked at this. Uh, there are two of these studies with very similar findings. Both of them added 75 units of gonadotropins on the day of the antagonist uh, start, and neither of them found a difference in the clinical outcome. So it appears that the dose of the gonadotropins does not need to be increased. Now, do we need to supplement LH? So if we suddenly decrease the uh, serum LH levels, do we have to make up for this by giving a um, uh, certain amount of uh, LH at the time of the stimulation? And uh, uh, the same French group that uh, did the estradiol pretreatment study looked at this. They used the 3 milligram GnRH antagonist uh, suppression and they randomly added 75 units of recombinant LH uh, when the antagonist was given and uh, they found no difference in the stimulation uh, parameters or the clinical outcome. A similar study was designed by a group in the United States by uh, Sauer et al. And again, uh, with uh, uh, the addition of 75 units of recombinant LH, no difference was seen in the clinical outcome. Uh, another European study by Griesinger et al. used the daily uh, antagonist from day six. Again, 75 units of uh, recombinant LH was started with the antagonist. No difference in the clinical outcome, so the pregnancy rate was not affected. An interesting study was published in 2011 by Bosch et al. Uh, they did the same thing, daily administered antagonist from day six uh, and supplemented recombinant LH. And what they found that among women over the age of 35, LH supplementation uh, led to higher implantation rate and the trend for a higher uh, pregnancy rate. So we can conclude from these studies that we do not need to add uh, recombinant LH when the antagonist is started, though it may be worth uh, in older women, uh, women over the age of 35. Now, can we use the antagonist protocol for uh, high responders? And um, uh, this uh, group from Greece did two studies. The first study uh, was uh, the flexible GnRH antagonist start compared to the luteal long stimulation for women with polycystic ovary syndrome. And with the antagonist, there was shorter stimulation. There was lower uh, total need for uh, gonadotropins. Similar pregnancy rates were achieved, and there was a low risk for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome with the antagonist. Uh, in their other study, they did the early start, the day one start of the antagonist, and again compared it to the luteal long uh, stimulation. Again, uh, fewer OHSS was seen in the antagonist group, but similar clinical pregnancy rate was achieved. And we are coming back to the topic of the pre previous uh, presentation. What is it that we can do with the poor responders? And I will just quickly go through the next two slides. Poor responders are poorly defined, uh, therefore, it's not surprising that we see all kinds of outcomes when we uh, compare the different stimulation protocols. Um, certain uh, groups found better rates with the antagonist, certain groups found no effect, no difference between the agonist and antagonist stimulations, and, and others uh, found improved uh, outcome with the agonist uh, stimulation. So we can again conclude that poor responders are hard to treat. Uh, the results are conflicting, and there's definitely a need for um, better stimulation protocols for them. Now, when we do in vitro fertilization and when we use down regulation, we need to trigger ovulation in order to be able to collect eggs. Um, in GnRH agonist cycles, this has to be HCG. 
with the GnRH antagonist, we can use HCG, the GnRH agonist, the recombinant LH, uh, to trigger uh, the uh, final oocyte maturation. It was shown that the egg yield and maturity is similar uh, with the different methods of uh, ovulation induction. Uh, but it was also shown that uh, when GnRH um, agonist is used uh, to trigger ovulation, pregnancy rates are lower and ovarian hyperstimulation rates are also lower. So this takes us to the next question. Do we need to do something differently in the luteal phase? And again, it's well known to all of us that following in vitro fertilization, there's a luteal defect. And there are many mechanisms uh, that explain this. Uh, all these methods that we use to trigger ovulation induce a short LH search, which is not enough to support the uh, whole luteal phase. Um, some of the granulosa cell mass is reduced that cannot luteinize and cannot support the uh, implanting um, uh, embryo. The stimulation leads to very high uh, steroid levels and the negative feedback will also cut the luteal phase um, shorter. And the steroidogenic enzyme uh, expression is also altered by the stimulation. There are many different things that we can do to support the luteal phase. One can do uh, repetitive doses of HCG to support the luteal phase, but this is associated with a, a significant risk of hyperstimulation. Uh, the luteal phase can be supported by uh, progesterone. Now, when the GnRH agonist is used uh, for, to, to trigger ovulation, progesterone alone is not enough. The options that one can do is either to do a very intensive luteal support with progesterone and estradiol, or another uh, option that was again discussed many times during this meeting is to give a small dose of HCG on the day of the retrieval to rescue the luteal phase. With uh, this uh, latter method, the pregnancy rates uh, seem to be comparable to the HCG-induced uh, cycles. So. We are now nine years uh, after the first meta-analysis, and if we include all these uh, studies that were done in, this, uh, uh, in these nine years, and we do a meta-analysis, we now find similar pregnancy rates with the agonist and the antagonist uh, protocol. And if, if we look back, none of those different ways of handling the GnRH antagonist cycle seem to make a difference. So it does appear that we just had to learn how to use the antagonist protocol. I've tried to summarize uh, the pros and cons of the agonist versus the antagonist. One of the things that we have to think about is cycle scheduling. Now, there's some flexibility with the cycle scheduling even when the uh, GnRH agonist is used, especially if there's an overlap between the GnRH agonist and the contraceptive pill. In the GnRH antagonist cycles, the use of contraceptive pills allows um, a lot of flexibility and even the luteal estradiol allows a lot of flexibility with the cycle scheduling. Now the stimulation duration is about a day and a half longer uh, with the uh, agonist long uh, protocol. There's a need for more uh, gonadotropins with the agonist long protocol. There's more side effects with the agonist long protocol. When uh, hypoestrogenism is uh, achieved at the time of suppression, a lot of uh, women complain about headaches, hot flashes, mood changes, um, and, and all sorts of um, uh, problems. If we add up the number of injections, just with the extra two weeks of preparation, uh, there's at least two times as many injections that have to be taken in the uh, agonist protocol. Now, you could use the, the depot injection, but then it really leads to a profound suppression, and then you need to increase your um, uh, gonadotropin uh, dose during the stimulation. One of the very important findings is that the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation risk is much reduced uh, in the antagonist cycles, especially if the agonist is used um, as a trigger. Um, by now, it looks like that the clinical outcome pregnancy rates um, are similar uh, with the two methods. The overall satisfaction, uh, mainly for comfort due to fewer injections, is higher with the GnRH antagonist. And at least based on Hungarian prices, uh, the, the fee of these two treatments is fairly similar. So we can conclude that uh, controlled ovarian uh, hyperstimulation is still a standard part of in vitro fertilization, and there are many different stimulation protocols and many different combinations of the various medications that can be used. GnRH agonist and antagonist can both be effectively used to prevent premature LH surges and therefore are standard parts uh, of the treatments. Clinical outcome is uh, similar with both protocols, but due to the additional benefits listed in the table before, 
we probably should move on and, and use the GNRH antagonist a lot more uh, over the long protocol. And thank you for your attention.